Here we are. Thank you so much for taking the time today to spend with us. I just, I can't tell you how much it means to us and uh, to, um, to the viewers are just going to have a field day seeing you. So thank you, Peter. It's an honor. Oh, thank you. I'm excited. I, uh, I, I'm very humbled by what's been going on in the last year, particularly in two years, really, in terms of the people that have reached out, both likes of yourself um, and then individuals who've been working with me, you know, who are sort of very established in the world. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just a regular guy. I do have a pretty unique perspective, but it's, uh, it just means a lot to me to hear those words. So thank you for saying that. You do have a unique perspective, but it, it it's uh, we honour your perspective. You know what you're doing to help people to open their open their perspective of themselves and truly connect yeah. with who they really are yeah. um, as a limitless being is is phenomenal. Peter, we understand that. Perspective is the miracle that can influence your life in a myriad of ways. Can mm. you explain to our viewers your understanding of the journey of self-discovery and how perspective might play a key role in this? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, to me, the way I would articulate it is perspective is reality, right? So the way that life occurs to us is the way that therefore we interact with life. Life is relative, meaning we garner an experience of ourself, others, and life itself by virtue of relationship to it. And what dictates relationship is perspective. Who we are fundamentally is a walking point of view. So, you know, there's a beautiful quote by the uh, British author Milton, and he said, the, the mind is a place within itself and can make heaven of hell or hell of heaven. So really it's all in the interpretation. Life is the way it is but only always is one of my quotes. And then there is our narrative about it. And people are under the impression that suffering and what they feel as a, as a sort of cause of their upset is somehow out there. And where we start to find true power, true empowerment and a sense of real uh, responsibility is recognizing no, life is the way it is. And then by virtue of the way that our brain is currently conditioned, we're interpreting data, external data, exogenous form, and then creating an internal experience. Why that is so profound is because I'm no longer then a victim of circumstance, but rather I am the source, the cause of my own experience by virtue of the way that I am perceiving what is going on around me. And that to me is such a beautiful revelation to have. It doesn't occur very often for people. We can call that an awakening or a form of enlightenment where it's like, holy moly, I've never actually been hurt by anybody. I've never actually been offended by anybody. They have said and done what they said and done. That doesn't condone their behavior. That doesn't mean that their behavior was easy to be around. And it doesn't mean that it was personally what I wanted. But nonetheless, the experience that it generated that was garnered from it was of my own creation. And so perspective is that lens through which I get to view life. And by virtue of the lens, I'm going to interpret dialogue and internally generate an experience that then I attribute to the external world, which then just logically, you can now understand why people are trying to control circumstance. Because if we are under the impression that I feel the way I feel because of my circumstance, then it's only natural that I'm gonna try and control my circumstance because I wanna feel good. But that is a game that is futile, not to mention incredibly exhausting, and it leaves people incredibly disempowered and frustrated because last I checked, you're not in charge of the universe and you can't control everything. <laughs> what is that relationship that you're actually talking about we get that it's a perspective and that everything that we see is simply a creation of our own perspective so everything is going to get mirrored back to us in every yeah. moment from whatever point of view that we're taking at the time mm -hmm. that relationship can you tell me a little bit more about who is and what is that relationship between that's a great question so the relationship itself so there's a you could say there's a multitude of levels of relationship and this is actually what i'm working on with regards to my book so we have multiple levels of relativity i have a relationship to my thoughts i have a relationship to my feelings i have a relationship to my physicality 
I have a relationship to others. I have a relationship to life, right? And so depending on where our predominant focus is, where is our main attention? We're going to elicit a response that is in direct correlation to the way that we relate to that particular aspect of life. So if somebody's walking around and they have a relationship to their physicality that we could say is rather self derogatory, like they don't like their body, maybe they've struggled with weight over the years, or they don't like some aspect of their features, then they're going to often relate to other people through the lens of physicality. What does that mean? They will see the person in the room who to them is pretty or who is thin. Or they might see somebody, you know, a gentleman who's in great shape and they're not. And so all it's doing is because they've already established that define themselves through the lens of some form of self judgment, then by process of co comparison and relativity, they're going to see that which they're not because the ego's number one priority is to be right about its own uh, perspective, which is madness when you get it. But the ego would rather be right about its own belief of inadequacy than create a life that it is completely and utterly joyous about. So relationship for that reason depends on the level that you're relating. And it is only through the mirror of comparison, as I said earlier, you know, life is based on the laws of relativity. Consciousness as oneness, without sounding too esoteric, doesn't have a relationship because if oneness is all that there is, then it doesn't know who or what it is because there's nothing to relate to, which is why relationships are so beautiful because they are the catalyst to reveal that which we have yet to reconcile within ourselves. And it is only through the dynamic of relationships themselves that we actually get that revelatory moment of where do I get upset? Where do I find love? Where do I get angry? Where do I feel shame? It is only by virtue of other people and life itself that I can get to process that. And therefore, my work, as you know, is about bringing freedom. And we find freedom by finding out where we're not free. And life is the mirror to discover for ourselves where we're not free. That we simultaneously are relating on multiple levels. You know, you can come home at the end of the day and know that you're tired. But you can also be simultaneously upset or excited, right? So there's a combination there of like, I'm relating to my physicality, I'm fatigued, but simultaneously, even though I'm tired and I've had a long day, I'm excited by whatever prospects came from the day. I'm moving to a cool place or I got a potential promotion or I got a new account and I've been working hard, but there is this sort of sense of reward that's coming my way. So at that time, you're simultaneously recognizing multiple levels within yourself whilst equally having a relationship to whatever it is that's giving you excitement or a sense of possibility. So all of these things are happening concurrently for sure. The, the degree to which we can bring awareness and sort of gently separate them is the degree to which we can garner some sense of like real empowerment versus feeling overwhelmed by all of these different ways that we're relating to life. And that's where I'd like to compartmentalize things in life is very helpful because we can go, okay, I'm not actually upset at my spouse uh, or whatever's going on in the home. It might be because I just have got some bad news in the workplace. And so that's really what is the quote unquote underlying perceived cause of my frustration. And now, you know, the term I use is just kicking the cat. You know, you come home, the cat doesn't know what the hell's going on, but you walk in the door and you kick the cat and the cat's like, what the hell did I do? Right. So it's just really an outlet for the frustration that was actually accumulated during the course of the day by virtue of other events that we've interpreted as somehow threatening to our existence, because that's all that's ever happening. When we get upset, the brain is interpreting a perceived threat to our survival. And then we will go into whatever adap adaptation mode to try and mitigate that and protect ourselves. Yeah. So, yes, multiple relationships happening concurrently, for sure. The degree to which we can bring awareness and attention and presence to those is the degree to which we can start to make space for the multiple faceted beings that we are. And what do you feel is one of the best ways to bring awareness to the multiple faceted relationships that we're having all of the time? Like to, to really understand that we might be frustrated about this one thing, it's coming out in a different way because we're feeling like our ego is threatened and we're in that survival state. 
Yeah. What is the best way, in your opinion, for us to be able to really bring consciousness to this internal dialogue and, and these feelings that are going on inside? So it's a great question. And the how is sometimes tricky, but it's really as simple as slow down and pay attention, right? Which we could say is presence and awareness. So the combination of presence, which is I'm not in my mind in sort of chronological psychological time sorry like so when i'm fully present i am where i am and awareness is i'm paying attention to whatever's going on most people are upset because their mind is stuck in psychological time they're in the perceived history or their past or they're in a perceived future neither of which is actually anything to do with the reality in front of them it's purely imagined right we're either recalling something or we're projecting something that we are imagining and these are the things that upset people. So the access to recognizing what's actually going on is to just slow down, have presence in the moment, realize that my life is not currently in danger, even though my mind might be telling me it is, and then notice, okay, what is the actual root cause of the current narrative? And that's where it gets very tricky because whatever you're thinking that you believe is the cause of your frustration, which is usually superimposed onto external circumstance, right? I'm upset because of what just happened or what somebody did or said. Now, if you can recognize, no, you're not actually upset by that. That is the catalyst to reveal where you're actually carrying some constraints, some underlying fear. And so if we can, if we can reverse engineer that and go, okay, where has this kind of experience happened before? Where did I feel the experience of anger? Where did I feel the experience of feeling judged or in some way made shamed? Where did I feel the experience of the fear of loss? And that will, I promise you, take you to a, usually a litany of experiences from our history where we've been carrying that concern for a long time. And now the same experience is being brought to the surface just by a different event. So if we can start to bring awareness to that, with a lot of compassion and self-love, it's okay. It's not the expression I use is it's not you, it's a pattern, right? It's not who you are. It's a pattern based on your conditioning because of all the trials and tribulations you've been through predominantly from your childhood that gave rise to some conditioning that made you feel inadequate, insecure, or that you were living from a mindset of scarcity. And now those concerns and those perceived limitations are simply being reminded. They're being triggered by an event such that you can actually look at it through the lens of truth and say, ask the question, is it true that who I am is not enough? Because the event seems to be triggering that. You know, somebody belittled me or I didn't get the promotion or the person I wanted to date didn't get back to me and now I'm feeling lousy about myself. The event is, is really immaterial. It is the gift to reveal what is the internal dialogue that we have about ourselves. So if somebody doesn't return a text or that we ask to go out on a date and they say no, and we feel depressed or we feel like we're worthless, that is a gift because that is not a truth about who you are. That is an old conditioned conversation that you probably started when you were age four or five by events because of what mum, dad, or whoever said, but not through any fault of their own, but it turned on this internal constraint that now we get to revisit and more importantly, we get to ask the question, is that truly who I am? Or is that just a perspective that I've created, reinforced and found evidence for over the time? Mm -hmm. Based on a moment in time that we, that we took on a perspective in order to keep ourselves safe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, somebody was texting me today about like what's going on in the world and you especially look here in the States with all the politicians, it, it is almost um, redundant to say, but they, they, lie, they lie, right? And then not to just put that on politicians, like, oh, they're bad people, everybody lies. It is part of the human construct, why? Because lying is a protection mechanism and it's twofold. We lie for fear that we're gonna be in trouble. When a child is first born, they don't know the mechanism of lying, right? They are just completely fully self-expressed. They'll happily throw up on auntie's Gucci dress. They don't know that that's bad. You know, they will scream when they're hungry or they don't get what they want. There's no current sense of constraint as it relates to how you're supposed to behave as a human being. They don't have that programming yet. But the first time they feel the sever of a loving environment where they're in trouble and they understand the energy of discipline, of oppression, of obedience, 
that they feel that they have done something wrong mm -hmm. is the first time that a being experiences the awful, the feeling of separation and dismissal. And from that moment forth, we are just through self-protection designed to make sure we do everything we can not to feel that again, because that hurt. And more importantly, primarily, we are designed, one of the primordial uh, directives of any organism is to stay alive, is to survive. And so any threat to us being part of the tribe, in this case, mom and dad, or a family with a roof over our head who are providing sustenance and food, any threat to the loss of that is how it's perceived energetically a threat to our existence. And so we will do everything we can to mitigate that, avoid it at all costs, and there is the birth of lying. If I can do something to make sure that even if I feel I've done something wrong, which I feel will, will lead to the consequence of discipline, which feels like dismissal and not being loved and therefore not being safe, then I'm going to do everything I can in my power to make sure that I avoid that. So that is one of the precursors to why people become corrupt, because they have learned the mechanism of lying. That's one part, self-preservation. The other part is self-adorning, meaning we will lie in a way that we want people to feel that we have worth. And when deep down we have a sense of worthlessness or we have the absence of self-value, then lying is another mechanism we will use to adorn our persona, to adorn how we perceive how we're perceived by those around us so that we can quote unquote impress. It's human. At one level, we can say that it's incredibly naive and for that reason, there's no judgment. It's almost innocent in its nature, but it has incredibly far reaching ramifications as we become adults and we continue to lie at great expense to other people. So yeah, lying and that feeling of fear that we are somehow going to be abandoned, we're going to be uh, excommunicated from our tribe is a threat to our existence and the human brain will do everything, as I said, in its power to make sure that we are protected. Do you, also, do you feel that it could also be a threat to our sense of self on some level because of that um, being judged, like that you're wrong? Like if you fear yeah. that you're, you've done something wrong and you're about to be punished and there's a choice to lie or not, that it's yeah. part of the self-preservation which I, you know, is exactly what you said, really, at the end of the day, it's about belonging to the greater anyway. Yeah. So if you think about like, so if you really feel into it, like, do you have kids yourself? Yes, I do too. Great. Okay, beautiful. How old? Uh, they are seven and 10. Great. So seven and 10 year olds, I promise you absolutely categorically, they both lied to you at some point. Multiple absolutely. Times. <laughs> and yet you adore the crap out of them, right? Well, because because, they, yes. And I have purposely tried to watch my behavior and my responses to see yeah. if anything that I'm doing has, um, has brought about a feeling of them of yeah. that they've done something wrong or that they've said something that I wouldn't like, you know, yeah. they want to please me. I'm their mommy. Yeah. Um, you know, they want me to look upon them with uh, love. And so I can yeah. definitely see that there have been moments where I have said or done things that have um, encouraged that behavior. So for me, it's about understanding um, my response to them and and just trying to to be as loving and caring and inclusive as possible. All of it, you know. Yeah good or bad it's not good or bad it's just what is and i'm yeah, gonna love you anyway <laughs> yeah you're doing the best you can as a mom and you've got your own conditioning so beautiful so you look at that energy you've got the real life experience of being a parent and you've got these children who just are as you said wanting to be loved by mommy really fundamentally as humans we want to be loved and accepted now as a child our love and acceptance is contingent on our care provider right so and there's a lot more significance with that because if we're not loved and accepted by the archetype of mom and dad who are really providing for our security for our safety for our preservation then that's got a lot more importance wrapped around it for which reason as a kid you're much more vulnerable you know as an adult okay fine if you're not loved accepted by your peer group or by the office or by the local tennis club or wherever you go and do you know go to the church or yoga you know it might not feel good but there's not the same sense of significance as it relates to your own self-preservation so this is where for kids it's so so 
important to me that parents understand the impact they have as it relates to a child's development to feel that they are in a trusting space where they are safe to be who they are. And let's face it, they're children. They're supposed to mess up. They don't know what the hell they're doing, right? Like, how are you, how are you gonna reprimand a four-year-old who was just so excited to try and contribute to cleaning up the table when they picked up the glass and they dropped it. It's like, how many, and it's sad to hear, you know, but how many parents actually will not necessarily scold, but some will scold the child, or they'll certainly verbally discipline them, but it's a four-year-old doing the best they can. So, you know, that's where I feel parents have such a responsibility to create the context of it's all okay. And of course, there's education. That doesn't mean that kids can be just running rampant and there isn't some form of education as it relates to discipline and what does and doesn't work. You don't want to see your child running down the hallway with a sharp knife chasing their sister, right? But at the same time, they're a child and perhaps they don't know better until, but to have that as a reprimanding type of situation versus an educational opportunity, you know, that's where there's such an opportunity to make a child understand that there are certain rules and regulations of being human and the world of physics that we live in that lead to serious consequences. Yeah. And I love you, right? Yeah. So you're a work in progress, as we all are, even as we get to be adults. Yeah. But children, certainly, they're clueless. So, but as soon as they feel that energy of dismissal, where they feel the energy of oppression, where they feel the energy of judgment, they are going to feel the severing of the bonds that they have with their parents and that is a threat to their existence. And so from that moment forth, they are, yes, going to do whatever they have to, to lie, to cheat, to hide, so that they don't feel the potential ramifications of doing something that they have learned through conditioning is no longer acceptable. You know, it's the way I phrase it is like, at some point in our childhood, we go from unconscious love, meaning, we don't even know that we are loved or not loved it's assumed right because we're a child we're a baby we are part of this clan this tribe this family and there's a point in our life usually around age two or three this is why it's the terrible twos that for the first time we experience that who we are is no longer enough prior to that we were being whoever we were and there was a sort of a much bigger carte blanche acceptance of our behaviors because even the parents understood, well, it's a baby. A baby's supposed to scream. A baby's supposed to throw up. A baby's supposed to poop in its diapers. But then there comes this transition point where we feel, we hear, and we may physically actually experience the discipline of feeling inadequate. That right there is such a pivotal point in the birth of the survival mechanisms of a persona. And it's sad, it's sort of unavoidable. To a certain degree, it can be at least, you know, uh, mitigated by parents who are incredibly loving and understand that's gonna happen. But it really is a soul's journey that now they've started this individualized experience of oneself and they're feeling somehow inadequate. And that's where all of these survival mechanisms and adaptations kick in, whether it be lying, pretending, showing off, whatever, being the smartest, being a people pleaser, you know, kissing mum's butt, whatever it is you feel you have to do in order to avoid the fear of rejection, judgment, and fu fundamentally being kicked to the street. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just on that level again, can I can I dive a little bit deeper? Yeah, do you, <laughs> in the work that that um, that I've done with people, it's so obvious that there are so many pivotal things, so many. Uh, in that age of around two. But there's also more that seems to come through uh, sometimes from people who are even, from when you're experiencing life from even younger age, like yeah. being a baby. When yeah. and, I, and I guess I've had a question of, um, you know, what we think, we think that there's not as much consciousness in an even smaller child, you know, or a baby, or when they've, you know, when they're a tiny little baby, but. Yeah through the experiences I've had with clients that there are times where they're having this kind of awareness, it might not be able, they, you know, they're not able to put it into words or anything like that because they're so young, but yeah. there is still a consciousness and th that feeling of separation that can happen even when they're younger than two. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, I mean, you want to go deep, deep. So the way I look at it is that this dimension, 
that we are in as human beings, to me, is a revelatory dimension. What does that mean? Life will reveal where you yourself as a being do not experience freedom. Now, that may sound poetic, but what it points to is that as I, sh as I share in one of my quotes, life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. So why is that a completely different perspective or a different way of looking at the experience of life? Because most people are playing the human game. What is the human game? They're trying to accumulate, right? Accumulation of status, accumulation of possessions, accumulation of finance. And they're trying to play the game of I'm becoming a better human by virtue of what I have usually. Now that's not wrong, but it's also to me, it's a powerless game to play. Whereas the awakening process of who I am as a being who is limitless, who is in its infancy and its true inherent nature, nothing but love, peace, power, freedom. These are our inherent qualities that to what degree can I use the tapestry, this paradigm of life as the catalyst to reveal what is in the way of me understanding my infinite eternal being. That is to me the game that's really afoot for human beings. That is the opportunity that it is to be a human is to awaken to the true essence of who I am rather than being defined by the persona that has been conditioned over time that is now founded in the essence of survival. That is two entirely different approaches to the human experience. One is linear and one is vertical, right? Mm -hmm. So linear is, okay, hopefully over time I'm going to improve. I got a promotion, I got a corner office, I got a bigger home, I got a nicer car, I've got a little bit more money. That is, you know, there's again, no judgment, but it is a futile dead end method of trying to find internal value by using external and exogenous means to bring some sense of worth versus discovering, wow, my inherent nature is freedom. My inherent nature is love. My inherent nature is peace. And life is constantly giving me the opportunity to awaken to those qualities by virtue of presenting to me, ironically, where I don't experience those. So that's why, again, I said, life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. We often look at those circumstances as frustrating, as things we don't want, but that's precisely why they're being given to us because we've yet to see how powerful and extraordinary we are, that we have yet to integrate those experiences and see that I can truly be with whatever is occurring and maintain my inner sense of peace and freedom and love. Beautiful. And do you feel like that that is the, the whole, like part of the purpose of why, we, why we're here? Like why we have this human experience is to... 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So to go back to your point, you know, like people talk about nature or nurture and, you know, it's both, right? Because I would assert, again, this is just Peter Crone's perspective, <laughs> but we arrive as beings, but shrouded in constraint. We arrive as souls, but, can, you know, constrained by fear. And the game of this particular dimension of planet Earth and being human is, oh, awesome. We are set here so that we can reveal where we are confined, constrained, and have some sense of separation and limitation. And so life is the process of sloughing by virtue of these trials and tribulations and these sort of confronting circumstances really is a form of resistance, which just like polishing a diamond, is allowing us to recognize where we still feel constrained or we arrive with our bucket of fears. And as I say, you know, the quote unquote winner of the game is who can get rid of their fears the, the fastest, right? Not that there is any urgency, but we could say, and I would assert the true liberation and true freedom, which is my main product, is when we have confronted all of the fears that we arrived with to recognize that in fact, there is nothing to fear itself whatsoever. And that was always just a narrative that was part of our persona or our ego that was just simply the, the cocoon in which we felt we needed to live in order to stay safe when in fact it's quite the antithesis of that, which is true security is when I no longer need the illusion of external security. When you start to realize that people are 
all carrying their own version of their cross by virtue of the trials and tribulations and hurts and disappointments and failures that they've all been through, then we might not necessarily condone their current behavior. And it may even be at some level detrimental to our own purpose. You know, if somebody is being obnoxious or abusive or harmful or hostile, that's not fun to be around. So I'm not exactly, as I said, condoning the behavior, but I would at least understand if I knew everything that they've been through. And that does breed more compassion. It does breed more acceptance. There's, of course, personal preference in that. I don't want to be around somebody who's going to be abusive or hostile, or, uh, bring sort of any kind of animosity or anger towards me. But I'm nonetheless not going to judge them. I'm certainly not going to use them as the excuse for anything that I might be feeling. Right. That would then leave me as being a victim of their behavior. And that would then suddenly leave me powerless and quote unquote, potentially in my mind, what I'm saying is they control how I feel, which when you break it down, makes no sense. Especially in this time right now, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of ugly behaviors going on out there in the world. And there's a lot of stuff that I certainly do not agree with. And there's certainly a lot of stuff that I feel is, um, detrimental to what it means to be human meaning there's a lot of disrespect there's a lot of oppression there's a lot of corruption there's a lot of you know control and lies and all of this and so it doesn't make it pleasant and it doesn't make it right but if we understand that this is part of the unveiling and the process of consciousness itself and these dark shadows whether it be of the traumatized male and the need to try and control everything with anger and domination, which we've seen obviously from men to women, and now we're seeing it towards minorities and whatever it might be. That's just part of the shadow that's coming to the surface. But I truly do believe that love and light will prevail and why the feminine particularly right now, which also is represented by mother nature, right? Mother nature is I think our saving grace where we do bring love, we bring nurturance, we bring, we bring an energy of love and acceptance, which is really what the quote unquote hurt little boy who turns into the oppressive controlling male is asking for. Now, of course we need both sides. It's not just like all guys are bad, but that quality of energy that is currently being displayed in the world is nonetheless, I feel a byproduct of internal hurt and fear that is trying to control circumstance to avoid the hurt that ironically it just keeps perpetuating. Mm, absolutely. And that love and acceptance and, and even integration, like bringing, bringing things in in that nurturing kind of way can do more to reconcile the situations rather than fighting against things because then you're just using the same kind of energy. You know, again, one of my, my, my quotes or anecdotal statements, I says that the ego doesn't want to be healed, it wants to be held. In this case, if you think of the ego as a child that is hurt, upset, it doesn't want to be told what to do. It wants to be reassured that it's okay to feel. You know, when people are like always trying to lean into like positive vibes or good feelings, they're denying 50% of what it means to be human, right? Which is that you're going to have, just by virtue of being a sentient being, you're going to have a myriad of different feelings, some of which you might think aren't great or they're negative. But to what degree can you be big enough as a human being to hold the space, the container of love, just like a really adoring mother does for her child, which she allows all of it to be there? Of course, she may have preference, but there's no judgment of a child that's just experiencing and self-expressing whatever's going on. That is the container of love that I want to inspire, that I do inspire for people to bring to themselves such that they can make space for their humanity, warts and all. Meaning it's not always going to be pretty, but that's the nature of love. The very nature of love is such that it actually makes space for that which isn't necessarily lovable. It's easy to love all the parts of you that you love. It's easy to love the parts of you that you like or that you think are your greatest features or your greatest character traits. But where can you develop love for the part of you that you find to be imperfect, to, to the part of you that finds to be flawed? That's the very essence of what love means, to make sufficient space for all parts of me, even those that my persona, my ego, are somehow belittling, berating, or judging. That is the antithesis of love. And so that is why it's almost beautifully designed that by virtue of being human, we are flawed, we are imperfect. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't understand what it means to develop true, unconditional love absolutely i could i totally agree and, and and when we can have that unconditional love for ourselves 
and accept mm. all of those parts of ourselves as being r regardless of how ugly or or how much you want to disassociate from it it's not being a part of you if we can um, love and accept all of those parts it just brings such incredible freedom to every yeah. aspect of your life and I, I've noticed that when you have that freedom in your life, you're able to give that freedom and acceptance to other people. When you can hold yourself in that place of care yeah. and unconditional love, then it makes it so much easier to accept and acknowledge and have compassion for other people as well. Yeah, because it goes back, you know, to how we started this, which is that life is all about relativity. Life, we know ourselves by virtue of the relationship we have to others in life. And so, if the experience I had with another person is of some form of disharmony, of judgment, of hostility, then that really is a reflection of what's going on inside of me. So as I say, as we express, so we experience, right? So if I'm expressing anger towards whoever or whatever the circumstance may be, then I am experiencing anger, right? So just as water travels through, say, a garden hose, if the garden hose was sentient and it had feeling internally, it would feel the passage of the water when it was cold or hot or how fast it's moving. So likewise, as we express our emotional state, we're under the impression that it's by virtue of what's going on outside of us. But whether it is or not, in the terms of our interpretation, we're nonetheless experiencing all of that. So then why wouldn't I, if I know that correlation, if I'm, if I'm actually aware of that formula, then why wouldn't I, wherever possible, bring an experience of love and joy to whoever it might be? Because then I'm equally the beneficiary of it. And this is why exercises like gratitude journals or going and being a volunteer and being of service to a community feels good. Why does it feel good? Because what I'm actually doing is I'm bringing the experience of my true self is what I would assert. And I'm sharing to another, I'm giving to another. And therefore, I am equally the beneficiary of my own active contribution. When people are really struggling with depression, one of the things that I'll often invite them to consider is go and work at a homeless shelter or go and work at a children's hospital for an afternoon. Because what they will, what they will garner through that experience is that they make a difference. And in the essence and the experience of making a difference to another human being, our stock price goes up we experience worth, we experience value, which again is going to offset the experience of depression, which is a heaviness and a worthlessness. Yeah. So wherever we can be of service without sounding too cliche, we actually are starting to really appreciate our ability to contribute to others and actually make a difference, for which reason, then we're experiencing our inherent value. And it doesn't matter how big or small, you know, I often use the example of a husband who's got stacks of cash you know, it could be his wife's birthday and they have a pretty abhorrent relationship, but they're staying together for whatever, you know, justified reasons they use. And he could buy that woman a Rolls Royce because to him, it doesn't matter. But she, because she knows the energy behind it, which isn't authentic, it isn't coming from a place of true thoughtfulness or love. It's just something material that doesn't actually have any contained consideration or, or real authentic love she could just feel completely dismissed even though on the surface it looks like he's given her this extraordinary gift conversely she could go outside and take the dog for a walk and she runs into a four or five year old who lives down the street who picks a flower that could even be wilted and gives it to her with a big grin and that in terms of the experience of contribution from another human carries so much more depth of authenticity and love because of the the in the innocence and the true vulnerability of that contribution that isn't fabricated it isn't manipulated it isn't it isn't from the world of i'm supposed to do this or i should it's because i generally want to contribute to you as another being and if people could really differentiate the difference between essence and form we get so caught up in the form meaning what is it that we're giving what is it that we're sharing versus how am I doing it? What is the energy by which I'm communicating and sharing with somebody? That's where the true value lies. And that I would assert is what everyone's actually looking for. And do you feel that being present completely changes that essence that, that, that you're giving the way that you're giving? If you're really present within yourself, then you're, you're coming from a completely different place when you're serving or giving to others. 
Yeah, so being present in all of its depths, I really feel is one of the greatest gifts you can give another human. And there's multiple facets to presence because presence isn't just a combination of, you know, your location in time, meaning I'm here with you right now and I'm not in my head thinking about what I just did or what I just heard or I'm not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. That's a component of presence. But there is a combination between time and space. Time is one aspect. But space is that I'm located physically with you too, which is an energetic representation of my ability to be with you. Like I'm literally being with you. I'm a human being. So presence is not only that I am here listening to what you say, but you also physically, energetically have my full attention. And I would put that under the auspices of true listening. And the way I describe true listening is it's actually a component of love because in the presence of somebody who truly listens to you and truly gets who you are regardless of what you're feeling you might have just got the greatest piece of news and you're fully exuberant and you're dancing around like a clown and you're so joyous or you could have just got the worst piece of news and you're in a flood of tears and you feel like life is over the essence of presence as i said synonymous with listening and true love is that i will hold a space for you as a being as you experience whatever you have to experience. And I will not in any way judge you, fault you, shame you, or guilt you for whatever it is you're going through, but rather I'll be the container where you have safety and love to be who you are in this moment, knowing that every moment itself is transitional. And therefore, this is something that you're currently experiencing, and I can be with that. If people knew how to access that which of course is part of my work to bring people to that place then the dynamic of intimate professional personal relationships would be so dramatically transformed we wouldn't even recognize this planet because if people knew to hold space for each other and listen from that place then there would be such instantaneous healing because all of the things that we carry that we feel we are ashamed of and therefore we can't share or we feel that we're going to be judged for and therefore we can't fully express that container of accumulated unexpressed emotions would suddenly be given permission to be spoken about to be shared in a loving safe environment and at that moment we would feel the instantaneous relief of not only expressing but embracing our humanity that is by nature as i said flawed but in a container, in a way that it's it's okay. I love all of you. And so rather than carrying all of these flaws, these, you know, these trials and tribulations that have left their dents and their hurts and their traumas and their dramas and the baggage that we refer to that everyone's got, and that then cascades into these survival mechanisms and these emotional reactions where we feel the need to adapt and dominate and be angry and judge other people and make them wrong in forms of, you know, way that we try to find value for ourselves, all of that, would be dissolved. And that would be extraordinary experience for humanity as a whole, because I'm saying that it's okay. It's okay. I see you. I get it. I've been through my own version. Maybe it's a slightly different narrative. It's a diet, a slightly different experience, but I can relate to the heart, uh, the, the heartache and hurt of loss. I can relate to the, the, the embarrassment of rejection. I can relate to the disappointment of failure. And as your humanity shows up in a vulnerable way in front of me and I hold space for it, I get to also see that my flaws, my imperfections are equally accepted here and that's okay. I, I totally get it. I completely get it and feel that as well, that it could take people and humanity to a completely different level when we are yeah. holding space for each other in that kind of way, in such yeah. an unconditionally loving way. given permission to experience and feel what you're feeling see the way i phrase it is like there's a sever in time you know there was an experience usually as a kid invariably as a kid where we went through something that we couldn't process it hurt you know i was talking to a client the other day they did quote unquote something that the parent decided was bad and wrong and they were kicked outside of the house to sit on the porch in the pouring rain 
at night crying. Now, that is an, an anomaly, sadly, to a child's experience, right? Some, I also know a child who was locked in a room and whipped with a bamboo cane when she was 11 by her own mother for three hours to the point that she was so swollen she couldn't even see from all of the hitting. That's obviously a much more traumatic experience. But for a child to be disciplined, sent to their room, told to go outside, I, maybe it's just because I'm overly loving and compassionate, but I love that part of me. But I could feel, I could feel the total absolute powerlessness and rejection and shame that child feels as they sit in the rain in the dark outside. And it breaks my heart. And maybe it's why I would do what I do. And there's no judgment of the parent, even though we could collectively as adults go, wow, that's just awful. How can you do that to a child? Well, if we knew that parent's upbringing, then again, we don't condone the behavior. I wouldn't want any child to experience that as much as they sadly do, but we would at least understand why the parent looks through that particular perspective that they think that that's what that child did was so bad that it warrants that kind of punishment, right? But why I'm bringing this up is that child can't process that. Children are so powerless, they're so vulnerable, they're so innocent. And so at that moment where their survival is jeopardized, where their sense of worth is completely diminished, their sense of love and acceptance is completely disintegrated, then that person that I'm now dealing with as an adult, as a successful adult, is still stuck emotionally in time 30, 40 years ago. And they don't know why they keep attracting circumstances, in this case, particularly with partners, where it doesn't work out because they're still at a deep, deep, deep level concerned that they might do something wrong and there will be consequences for that. And so the way they survive in this case might be people pleasing, going above and beyond for the person because they want to make sure that they don't ever do anything to upset the archetype that was really role modeled by a parent who in their own way thought they were disciplining a child, but they left a scar emotionally that has been with that person for three, four, often more decades and define their persona in the way that they have psychologically adapted and created behavioral like um, compensation patterns in order to try and avoid the feeling of rejection that has got nothing to do with today. And that is the accumulation or what I call the emotional obesity you know, where we haven't been able to process something and in actually in Ayurvedic terms, which is part of my work, the six stages of disease start with accumulation, where we accumulate something that couldn't be digested or processed. And eventually it leads to a state of disease, or in this case, psychologically dis-ease, the absence of ease. I no longer feel safe in my environment. I no longer feel loved by virtue of what happened. And then that becomes a set of eyes that we go through life looking through. And then we wonder why we attract circumstances and people that continue to reveal our feeling that I'm still doing it wrong and I'm still not loved for who I am. Even though that's no longer the truth, the person may actually adore you, but because you're looking through that particular lens, that's all you see. And so being able to collapse time for people and bring them back to current like presence, really where they are right now, by reconciling their entire history is absolutely the most liberating experience any human being can do because at that moment they completely get their humanity they drop all judgment of themselves and consequently whoever it was that seemed to inspire that and they find full self-love and acceptance and that is to me the greatest gift any human being can have which is true freedom i agree so would you say that that is what happens to you when you um when you fully and truly love and accept yourself what is it that happens if people completely love and accept themselves what would that look like for somebody when, when you really discover what it means to fully accept who you are all aspects then that i would assert is the discovery of what love is it's really that simple like you know it's very easy as uh, spiritual teachers and esoteric philosophers and poets to talk about love as though that is our nature and i'm not denying that but it's one thing to know that okay i am love it's another thing to experience i am love and the way i've often used for myself as an expression is i say i am in love and people often will say wow that's awesome congratulations <laughs> and i'm like no 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 like i am in the energy i am in the essence i am bathing within 
the quality that is love itself. Uh, that, yes, of course, I love companionship. I love falling in love with other. That's a fun experience. But to recognize that I am actually held by the essence of love itself, that is, I would say, not only a rare experience that's an anomaly to the norm, but I would assert it's actually what we're all here for, is to awaken to the fact that I am held by the container of the essence of love itself. And until such time that I get that, I will invariably be seeking it through the, you know, the adoration or the validation or the reassurance of other, for which reason I will constantly be dependent on what they do or say to the point that everything is now a perceived threat. And for that reason, I will be perpetually in a state of exhaustion, which is really a futile battle for me to overcome the fact that I believe that there's fundamentally something wrong with me that's not lovable. And therein lies the biggest pretense of all, that I somehow believe that there is something wrong with me and I'm looking to the outside, the outside world to compensate for that or to reassure me otherwise, which is, again, it's a futile plight because if that's how I've defined myself, then it doesn't matter how many millions of people might love me until such time that I really get that for myself, it's all window dressing. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. what acceptance is. It is the discovery of what it means to truly be in the essence of love itself, not to be loved, but to be love itself. Mm. To live in the space of in love. You know, Einstein said, you either you look at the universe in one of two ways, either like everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle, right? And so really when you get like, we are beneficiaries of life, even though again, I've been through a shit ton of what felt like unnecessarily hardship that at the time my little persona was like, I don't want this, this sucks. But really, in hindsight, as often the case, we recognize, wow, if it weren't for those events, if it weren't for those, you know, hardships, then I wouldn't have discovered that expansiveness of what I've just stepped into. And why I use the expression that smooth seas never made a good sailor, right? So we need adversity itself is the catalyst for growth. It is life is the greatest teacher by virtue of the fact that it gives us challenges so that it can, as I said earlier, slough off anything that is confining us, anything that is holding us back, a constraint that is in some way limiting our self-expression. We need some resistance to get rid of that. And that is, you know, at times a very difficult pill to swallow, but it is nonetheless the catalyst to discover that really we are held eternally. It's like the metaphor or the image of these trapeze artists, right? The experience for anybody who goes up on a trapeze from the perspective of the ego is fear if there's no net, right? You, you would feel such intrepidation of letting go of the trapeze bar to transition maybe to your partner and be caught in the absence of knowing there was some safety net. And that's the ego's experience as it goes through life. It feels that at any turn, its existence is in potential danger. Everything can come across as a potential threat. And that's an exhausting place to live from. Conversely, if we can tap into this deeper essence of understanding the nature of life and particularly the nature of who we are, then at every turn, there is always a safety net. It might not feel like it, but we can drop, we can fall, we can miss the grip of the partner as we transition from trapeze bar to trapeze bar, and it's okay. And that we could say our errors, our mistakes, our failures, and it's okay. And that's why, again, as parents, the degree to which they can afford that same energy of acceptance to a child as they stumble, as they fall, literally from you know learning to walk, to riding a bike, to driving a car, whatever it is that they are taking on as part of their expansion as a human being, they are going to make mistakes along the way. And as Winston Churchill said, you know, true success is marching from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think that that, that feeling of no loss of enthusiasm comes from, a, from that larger perspective, like from that parent perspective that can see that that child is growing and needs to learn these things in order to, it needs to fall down to know how to get back up again. It needs to, yeah. you know, it needs to have those experiences of uh, so so that it can learn and grow. And if we can take that kind of perspective of our own life when we have failures or 
when yeah. things don't work out exactly the way that we think that they should or could that if yeah. we take a step back and have a look at the grander picture that we can understand that then there's reason for that as well that's all part of the growth and part of us learning how to express ourselves more fully yes it's you know the, the expression i use is i say we're all masterpieces and works in progress simultaneously so to be human is to be extraordinary you know i have a quote that i put up actually on a piece of art that i give to people sometimes as a gift which it says even on your worst day you're a living miracle if you think about the trillions of reactions that are happening just within the biochemistry of our physicality it's it's overwhelming that we can eat food with friends at a dinner table and our body will take care of the process of digestion when to secrete the bile from the bile ducts when to release more hydrochloric you know acid to to break down the food the mechanisms that then have to actually occur as it goes through the small intestine food is separated you know absorbed and then it's taken to the cellular level and there's all of this metab metabolism that takes place at an even deeper level so that the apple that you just ate at some point will become a liver cell i mean that is just mind blowing like magic right yet we don't think about it so when you really understand the the endless myriad of of transactions that are happening in the human brain and the human body that actually gives us the experience of being alive it's it's humbling you kind of can't help but feel a sense of gratitude and grace by virtue of the fact that i have a human as a human i have the capacity to see the people i love i have the capacity to communicate the way that i feel about myself life and others the fact that i can smell the sense that we are you know so gifted with through spring that i can hear the dulcet tones of a loved one or a child telling me what they feel and i can taste the extraordinary abundance of these different flavors that we get to experience by virtue of mother nature just those five senses that we take for granted every day they are such exquisite pieces of machinery that it's it's from when you really get it it becomes impossible to not reveal life your own and others to recognize what an immaculate conception every being is by virtue of the gift that it is that we get to experience life at all being human is the opportunity and so when you recognize that by virtue of your birth by virtue of being here and again i am not in any way diminishing or demy you know um dismissing the hardship that many people go through there are people literally starving i can talk about the joys of tasting food and people are like well that's great for you i don't have any and so that is something that collectively we have to do a better job of right there is such an equality but so but nonetheless for whatever reasons in terms of that person's karma there is an opportunity whether it be through self-worth and empowerment to transform their circumstances to find you know a better for a uh, source of life for themselves so that that is to me you know something that really hit home many years ago was that just to be alive is itself a miracle and from that moment forth i stopped berating myself I'm not perfect and there's so so much humility and um patience that we can develop when we understand that and then afford others and so certainly as it relates to kids you know their central nervous system is developing at every stage as it is still for me if I try and take up a new language or I try and take up a new activity I'm not going to be that good at it because it's not something that I've assimilated into the way that my brain's currently programmed. So, if we could afford each other just a little bit more patience, a little bit more compassion, a little bit more empathy for the fact that it is difficult. It is sometimes challenging to take on a new task. And that's okay. Then that again would make for a much more loving and accepting uh society. Um but within that we never neglect the magic that it is to be a human being and in and honestly to be any form of life <laughs> you know you just look at just the intricate details of say a little spider like i mean it's just insane like that is magical 
Now, I might not necessarily want that spider crawling across my face in the middle of the night, depending on what kind of spider it is, but I'm certainly going to revere the fact that that is an expression of life, and it, at some level, is just absolutely mystical. Absolutely mystical and magical, and the diversity is even more amazing too. And what do you feel about the diversity of life and the different, how that fits together with people as well? Like all of us connecting and relating together. I guess it brings us that might bring us back to the question at the beginning about relationships. Do you feel yeah, the purpose in diversity? I think diversity really what it allows us to see is the experience of abundance, right? Which again is another facet of what I would assert is our true nature. You know, in an environment where there's a limited experience of life, there's something that becomes unfulfilling, right? Because it doesn't resonate with our soul because I think in our soul, we, we feel that expansiveness. At that level, we feel the limitless nature of possibility itself. And so I think life is purely the mirror through the context of time and space through which we get to see the expression of who we are in our fullest capacity. So consciousness in its myriad of forms, as you said, with this endless forms of diversity is really curious to know itself. It's almost like, wow, who am I? I mean, you think about any human being, certainly as you get to a particular age, who doesn't look at themselves in the mirror? Now, there could be a multiple number of reasons why people do that from van true vanity to concern in terms of how I look or if I've got a blemish or a pimple on my forehead or whatever it is, right? But I would assert that underneath it all, there is just the energy and the essence of curiosity. One of the number one questions a child asks is why? Why? Why, mommy? Why? Why? And that to me is the embodiment through the innocence of a child, which is the energy of pure curiosity. We are here as explorers. We're curious to know who we are, to know what's possible, to know others, and to know the essence of life itself. And I think what happens is we lose that innocence of curiosity, which has got an explorative quality about it, where we become adventurers into the realm of consciousness itself to see what is available. And we become searchers where we're driven by our inadequacies, we're driven by limitation, we're driven by insecurities to seek something that we feel is missing. And to me, that is the complete contradiction to who we are, which is we are in fact everything. And when we come from a perspective of exploration and we are spiritual adventurers to reveal the multifaceted aspect of who we are, then life becomes this just magical journey into unveiling all of the different things that we feel are possible and even those that we didn't even know was possible, but nonetheless are facets of who we are at the deepest level. And that's again, a completely distinct way of living from I think how most people live. To look through the eyes of a child yet not be childish is to have a complete fascination and a mystery in life. And I think it's one of the gifts that parents get is that they, through their children, get to vicariously experience everything again, but with a sense of newness, with a sense of fascination, where oftentimes the adult mind has become resigned and cynical, when in fact their child reminds them of the magic of what it is to go on a roller coaster, or they remind them of the fascination and the excitement of what it is to jump in the ocean. And so that to me, if we can maintain that sense of aliveness for the magic that it is to be alive without becoming too stiff and too, you know, stubborn in our perspective as though everything just isn't going our way, but stay open to the possibility that life is itself, like that is its very nature, then that gives rise to an entirely different experience of what it means to be alive and to be human, to really experience the magic. And as you said, the complete diversity of this paradigm that we all get to joy, you know, enjoy, hopefully, again, there's some, there's some trials along the way, but that this diversity is the catalyst for us to see the multifaceted nature that we all have as the core of our essence. Awesome, absolutely. Yeah. You have expressed that suffering is a part of the human experience and you've likened it to how a diamond is formed by the pressure it physically experiences. Mm, right. But you also talk about your brand being freedom. So yeah. what does it 
mean to you to be free and how can we attain a place free from suffering if it is an inherent part of the human experience? Great question. So, you know, suffering is an inherent part of the human experience. And what I'm going to say here is sort of a segue, but hopefully will point to what I'm wanting you to understand, which is the way life occurs to us is that there's always somewhere to get to until you realize that there isn't. So suffering similarly is always present until you realize that there isn't suffering. And that to me is the beauty of the human experience. So suffering is unavoidable by virtue of we're here, but nonetheless, the opportunity, the possibility that it is to be human is to transcend suffering. And it's such a beautiful design again, because if it weren't for the previous suffering, we don't get to experience the latter freedom. As an adult, I, got to see myself in a picture, an old black and white, of me as a child, in my cute little onesie, whatever it is, running with my arms out. My mother is sort of very gently ushering me from behind. So you can see that she's sort of directing me towards somebody who you can't see because they're off camera, they're out of frame from the picture. But I know because of the setting, it was set at a harbor, at a dock, where the boat had just, you know, uh, come to birth and we've probably come off the boat and I'm running towards my dad because my dad worked on the boats and as I looked at that photo and it's this old black and white and this adorable little child which you know at one level is weird to think of as myself but it was nonetheless me as a little baby is running towards his father who he loves his dad and what it occurred to me is at that moment one of the most important parts of love is the energy of missing somebody. We often think that love is I'm with someone, I'm sharing uh, a dinner with them, I'm going to bed with them, or it could be a family member who I'm living with, or I'm sharing time with constantly. But that denies the, the, the flip side of the same coin, which is one of the most beautiful aspects of love is what feels like the absence of the experience of love. And we can call that missing somebody. And why it was so profound for me is to see that little child run towards his dad with the excitement of the fact that for a minute, for a minute, maybe a day, maybe a week, it could be longer, we experienced the separation from that which we love. And if it weren't for the experience of separation, we would not appreciate the joy of love. And so why I use that example as it relates to suffering and freedom is because separation is hurtful, it's painful, and that is suffering. And in this case, suffering is where we become separate from the knowledge, from the true wisdom of our true essence. Whilst freedom is the remembrance and the awakening to the essence of who I am at my core, which is freedom. So the two are inextricably connected and simultaneously necessary in order to experience one or the other. If it weren't for the experience of missing, I don't get to go to the depths of the joy of love. And equally, if it weren't for the pain and the seeming like inconvenience of human suffering, then I wouldn't get to experience the elation and the joy of liberation that is true freedom. When you really understand that dynamic, it's so beautiful to see the duality of everything. Yeah. And I would actually take it a little deeper, which is to say that freedom really is the container. Like love is the container that holds both, right? So we have the joy and we have the misery. We have the happiness and we have the sadness. And this is where if we can be big enough, expanded enough as human beings, then we make space for all of it. It would be as nonsensical, you know, for people who think they just want to be positive and happy. That is like asinine. It, it, it would be like me saying, no, no, no. All I want to do is inhale because that's so good because you get oxygen. <laughs> if you're like, what the hell? Like if it weren't for the fact that I get to exhale <laughs> and let go of, you know, in this case, obviously, physiologically, biologically, the toxins of carbon dioxide and stuff that no longer serves me because it's already served its purpose in my body, 
then I wouldn't get the joy of having that cyclical like um, process of inhale, exhale that keeps me alive. So similarly, the actual nature of duality, both parts are other flip sides of the same coin that are an inherent experience of being human. And the degree to which we can embrace both is the degree to which we are truly free to allow all aspects of what it means to be human. So suffering is really one aspect, but it is an aspect where there is ultimately a form of ignorance. And I don't mean that as a judgment. I mean it truly in the fact that we don't know something. We suffer because we don't know how extraordinary we are. We suffer because we don't know that we actually are loved. We don't, we suffer because we don't feel safe. And it is in that ignorance, the not knowing, the absence of knowledge that we suffer. And the process of awakening is realizing, oh, these are lies. And as I transcend lie, I expand into my bigger nature, which then is the experience of liberation, which is contained in the, as I said, the safety that we are held and beneficiaries of life because we are fundamentally loved. Beautiful. And I think where people are very hard on themselves is that they equate not knowing something with stupidity. And if they could actually just recognize, no, you have the capacity to know, you just haven't either given it attention, you haven't been given the resources, you haven't been in a space where that was taught to you. So it doesn't mean that you don't you know, have the capacity or the potential to know something, which therefore appeals to your possibility and your ability to expand, which is beautiful. And why I said, you know, that we're all masterpieces, but equally, you know, works in progress. So that's where we can acknowledge that I'm not supposed to know everything, but nonetheless, I admire, I revere, and I respect my capacity to know more, which is the game of progression versus perfection. Mm. And I think where people are very hard on themselves is thinking that they're supposed to be this completed, perfect piece of art versus recognizing, no, you're constantly a work in progress and that there's something joyous about that. I get to explore facets of myself that I've yet to actually tap into. And if it weren't by virtue of the fact that I didn't know something, then I wouldn't get to see what I'm capable of. We understand uh, that the notion that doing something wrong is simply a perspective based on a judgment that there is a right way and a wrong way. But can you explain to the audience why you see that there's nothing wrong with them and yeah. to help them reconcile the notion that they've never done anything wrong in the first place. For sure. It's, um, it's such a powerful subject because it's very touchy and it triggers a lot of people because we're so conditioned in the world of duality where from a very young age, we've been indoctrinated with the idea that something's good, something's bad, something's right, something's wrong, right? Even to the degree that people still through pure misunderstanding, and I would assert ignorance, distinguish good or bad based on someone's skin color, for example, right? That would be as asinine as somebody looking at the same car, the same model, the same age, it's brand new, two BMW, five series, whatever. One's, you know, orange and one's green and saying that the orange one's better. It, is, it doesn't even make sense, right? So. And that may or may not be appropriate to the question, but the point is it, it is so weaved into the fabric of what it means to be a human being that people sadly fight for these beliefs to the point of destruction of self or other, right? If you look at all of the bloodshed, the millions of lives that have been lost, lost over the centuries by virtue of religious beliefs, for example, that our God, our doctrine is right and yours is wrong. And then it comes down to the micro version of that in a household where the husband is right and the wife is wrong, but she thinks she's right and he's wrong, which leads to such disharmony and such dissatisfaction and hostility and oftentimes actual abuse, whether it be verbal or physical. So all of this physical suffering, the disease that exists between people is by virtue of the lens that we look through where we truly believe that our opinion is right and somebody else's is wrong. Now, when you really get the audacity of that, it is so obnoxious to think that who you are is so pristine as a human being that you know how the universe should be and how everybody should act in it. 
when you really get that it is as i said such an audacious perspective that when i saw that because i did have my own version that i did feel that like maybe an old girlfriend shouldn't have behaved the way she did or she should have remembered my birthday or she should have got me something else or the whole world of shooting all over people it is such an obnoxious perspective that is the antithesis of love and acceptance that it does create all of the disharmony and disease as i said between people so when you wake up to realize that yes i'm not condoning behavior and the wrong argument does elicit a lot of deep questions of like real um indiscretion that occurs out there from criminals to physical abuse to sexual abuse there's a lot of evil that is occurring out there there's a lot of consequences that i wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy that nonetheless i would still invite people to understand are not wrong as a narrative as a as a distinction in language they carry physical consequence and oftentimes societal consequence it's not wrong to speed on the motorway or the highway but if you get caught by a policeman with a speed camera you might get a ticket you might get you know to do traffic school whatever the consequence it's not wrong to drink obscene amounts of alcohol but de depending on the constitution that you have whether you're an ox or you're very frail it's going to impact your liver over time to the point that you could become very sick right it's not wrong to smoke cigarettes but at this point we know that there is the detrimental effect of nicotine and putting smoke in your lungs again if you're built like an ox you might get away with it for a while if you're uh, predisposed because you have a weaker constitution and then certain behaviors like that are going to lead to an imbalance in sickness but i want people to understand it through the lens of subjective narrative nothing is wrong it just carries the laws of physics and that's where if we really get that everybody's got an opinion it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong it's just an opinion it's a perspective i can listen to everybody it doesn't mean that i have to believe what they're saying that is the power of listening and it's a very potent place to stand because i can honor someone's perspective without necessarily having to acquiesce to it i don't have to support it i don't have to deny it i just get that's where they're coming from now of course the line gets blurred when somebody's perspective starts to impact your own life right if it's a boss in the workplace and what they believe and how they treat you well you know that could become detrimental to somebody's work experience it could become detrimental to somebody's actual health that's an incumbent upon the person to not see that as wrong but rather to revisit why am i allowing this in my life do i consider myself of such low value that i'm willing to tolerate whether it be this professional situation or this personal situation in the way that someone's abusing me right so it's not like we become martyrs and we become like these gluttons for punishment because like oh it's okay they're not doing anything wrong he only hits me once a month no i'm not saying that's wrong but i'm also inviting you to consider where is the absence of love for yourself that you're willing to tolerate that right if we understood that person's upbringing and how they were treated and the discipline through hitting and spanking or punching was what they became accustomed to then we could suddenly realize oh okay well that's how they express their own frustrations because that's what they've learned if they grew up in madrid they learn spanish if they grew up in a hostile environment they learn hostility if they grow up in an environment where there's mercurial emotions and somebody's suddenly screaming and then they're not that's invariably the way that they're going to also interact in their personal relationships so it doesn't make it wrong it's just the way somebody's quote unquote being conditioned so that's where it's a very sensitive subject because people hear this sometimes in the quote unquote inaccurate way i'm not saying that i condone behavior i'm all about reverence for life i'm all about respecting people i'm all about coming from love compassion patience and peace for people and that sadly is not usually the norm so it would be easy for me to say well that's bad and that's wrong but there's a deeper sense of understanding patience and and compassion that everybody is doing the best they can within the limits of their current conditioning that does not condone the behavior and nor does it mitigate the consequences of it you know if somebody is violent to another person then for sure there's consequences to that behavior and i hope you know there is justice served in whatever way is fair so that that person gets to do whatever healing they need to do but that is the way that i understand help people understand there is no such thing as wrong wrong is a subjective narrative that we have individually collectively ascribed to behavior 
If you grow up in one particular group or society or community, then what you think might be wrong is very different to a different community. So there's sort of this consensus by a multiple of people that makes something wrong even seem more catastrophic. But it's only because a lot of people believe it, right? It's still just a narrative based on a perspective. And it's not wrong to think that something's wrong, to take it even deeper, right? It's just human. But then nonetheless, I'm just inviting people to consider there's nothing wrong, there's just human behavior and the physical consequences of that, many of which those behaviors I do not appreciate, I do not condone, and I personally wouldn't accept. I would remove myself from an environment where there was something being, quote unquote, brought into my space physically, verbally, emotionally, that was discomforting or didn't value how I value myself. I would nonetheless not make that person wrong. I would just through love and self-care remove myself from the situation. Now, for a lot of people, maybe they don't have that privilege or they don't have that opportunity, especially a kid, right? If a kid is in an environment where they're being exposed to a lot of hostility, a lot of discipline, and maybe even potential abuse, from an outsider's perspective, that is very easy to judge and say it's wrong. Right. And I certainly, as I said earlier, I wouldn't want a kid to be in that situation. But if we understood that parents upbringing and that's how they were treated. OK, it doesn't, as I said, uh, make the behavior OK, but at least we start to have some compassion and we'd understand why that parent is treating the child that way. And so when people are berating themselves for being wrong or for doing yeah. wrong things or, um, you know, they, they feel that they're wrong. How, yeah. how, what's the best way for, in your opinion, for people to get out of that sort of position, to, to take a different perspective? So when people are in their own dialogue of self-judgment, they're making themselves wrong for what they did or what they said or the failure that they just experienced or the fact that they feel they messed something up. And the thing to notice is what does that conversation and the feelings associated with it call for? That may be a weird sentence, but what is the dialogue that we're experiencing and the consequential emotions that go with that? So if I'm berating myself for being an idiot, that I messed something up, that I failed, and then I'm feeling the sense of shame, guilt, depression, embarrassment that goes with that. My question to everybody is, what are those feelings calling for? So if a child is feeling shame, what are they calling for? If a, a child or a human is feeling embarrassment, what are they calling for? Meaning, what is the energy? What is the dynamic that somebody in a state of guilt is asking for? It's okay. It's okay. You're doing the best you can. And this comes back to why I said that the predominant energy that any human being is looking for is love and acceptance. Mm. Because we are all fatally flawed. You know, as I say, please never become perfect. You'll have no one to relate to. Because we are by design imperfect. And imperfect itself is not a truth. It is a delineation. There's absolutely nothing imperfect about us. It's a narrative but it is nonetheless our experience of ourselves and oftentimes the experience of others. And so we want to make space for that perspective, even though the perspective itself is flawed because nothing is perfect or imperfect. It's just the way it is. What it is an invitation to is can we be with, can we accept everything the way it is, even if it's not what we want currently, even if it is maybe difficult to actually be with currently, what is the lesson? What is the opportunity? Who am I becoming in the face of this adversity? That means that by virtue of the trials and tribulations, I'm expanding as a human being such that I get to see the deeper magnificence of who I am in my capacity to hold space for things that previous iterations of myself would have been triggered by or upset by. That is the spiritual evolution of a human being who continues to expand beyond constraint so that I see the absolutely unlimited nature of my ability, the eternal, the, the boundless quality of my peace and my love to hold space for, to integrate all of that which previous versions of myself perhaps wasn't able to be with. That is the joy of expanding as a human being, to see that once something that was upsetting to me, now I can either just be with or oftentimes even laugh with and realize 
that I have become consequentially a much more powerful human being, which is, I would assert, a much deeper reflection of my true essence. Yeah. I think you're absolutely amazing. And I'm really appreciating you, all right. of the things that you've done, everything that I've seen. And this, Thank you. these moments that we've been able to share together, I'm just extremely grateful to you, Peter. Well, a joy to be with you, my dear. And I really appreciate the words of love and kindness and, uh, and, and appreciation, they're heartfelt. I get it. I see the same in you. And uh, I'm very excited that life saw fit to introduce us and that we got to spend this time together. I, I'll be forever grateful and I won't forget it. Neither will I.